good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Claiborne. I'm Director of Programming at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's or this afternoon's program, Invisible Warriors, African American Women in World War II, uh, created by Gregory Cook, uh, Professor Gregory Cook, who is on the line with us today. Our uh, post-screening conversation will be moderated by the incredible Stephanie Renee, who's also on the line with their bright and beautiful smile. Thank you for being here. Uh, this screening uh, is part of a, a series of virtual programming that, that the museum has developed since the beginning of the pandemic and continued with in order to uh, stay connected to our audiences, our stakeholders, and the folks that kind of live and dwell with us here in Philadelphia and beyond. So I'm going to let Professor Cook introduce the film. However, uh, let's take a moment and just hear a little bit about his work. Uh, Gregory S. Cook is a career educator, documentary filmmaker, and World War II historian dedicated to helping relocate African Americans from the margins to the main pages of American and global history. He is the founder and president of the Basil and Becky Educational Foundation, uh, Gregory is the creator of Invisible Warriors, African-American Women, World War II, which we'll see in just one second, a critically acclaimed feature-length documentary that explores the wartime experiences of 600,000 Rosie the Riveters, hidden figures, pioneers who courageously uh, triumphed over racism and sexism to create job opportunities in industry and government for themselves and future generation. Gregory is the driving force behind the historical documentary, Chocolate Soldiers from the USA, the untold story of 140,000 African-American men and women who crossed a racial divide uh, and formed an unexpected bond with British civilians during World War II. Uh, Gregory speaks at universities, museums, and cultural institutions about African-American participation in World War II. After a long and rewarding teaching career at Drexel University and Community College uh, of Philadelphia, Gregory devotes his energies to continuing his educational mission. Gregory earned an MA in journalism from Ohio State University uh, and a BA in English from the American International College. Welcome, Gregory. Welcome to the audience who's tuned in uh, with us today. Uh, thank you for the uh, great introduction. I'd also like to say welcome to Stephanie uh, Renee, who's going to be our moderator. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, divine forces of the universe and our ancestors for allowing allowing us to safely gather today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, James Claiborne and the uh, AMP community for pulling everything together to host the screening of Invisible Warriors African American Women in World War II. Uh, COVID-19 has not made any of our lives easy and James has steadfastly worked with me to make this event possible. And again, we have the incomparable Stephanie Renee who you know, be our moderator and, and be running the Q&A after the uh, documentary. Uh, I'd also like to thank my media team for, uh, for help uh, in putting this documentary together over many years. It's been an 11 year journey. And I have to specifically thank uh, Richard E. Dean, my cameraman, editor and friend uh, who transitioned in January. So this is always a bittersweet uh, day whenever I have to do this, this screening, because my heart is still a bit heavy uh, about his, his transition. And I got to say, without Dean's, uh, he's an award-winning win uh, uh, cinematographer, and without Dean's excellence, uh, none of what you're about to see would exist. So Invisible Warriors, African-American Women in World War II illuminate, illuminates the stories of 600,000 African-American Black women. This is my favorite Rosie of all. This is Ethel Rebecca Becky Jones Cook, my mother. And uh, my, when, in 1943, my mother rode in a Jim Crow car on her suitcase from Norfolk, Virginia to Washington, DC to get her very first job as a clerk typist in the US Patent Office. And my mother used to tell me about her story when I was a little boy before I started school. 
And the only thing I, I'm sure the only reason I remember her story, she never mentioned uh, World War II. She never mentioned Rosie. She certainly didn't mention the fact that she was in a Jim Crow car. But what she mentioned was the fact of her train ride. And I've had a lifelong love affair with trains. Um, I actually worked uh, for Conrail starting out as a brakeman, a freight brakeman, and I survived six train crashes before going into HR. And so this, it's, it's been this lifelong love affair I have with trains. I'm convinced is the reason why I remembered my mother's story. But like I said, Ethel Rebecca, Becky Jones Cook, my favorite Rosie of all. So as we talk about the significance of black women, uh, we need to remember that prior to World War II, more than 80% of all black women who were employed were either domestics or sharecroppers. And what that really meant, if you were a domestic, you got paid very little. If you were a sharecropper, you didn't get paid at all. And so as we look at these 600,000 women, right? If you look at the 1940 census, which was the last census taken before World War II, if you put all 600,000 of those black women in one city, they would have been the 13th most populous city in America. That gives you some idea of, of how large a number of women we're talking about. Um, they are arguably the most significant group of black women in the 20th century. Uh, prior, they, they brought millions of dollars into the black community. That was a first. They gained self-confidence by successfully handling their jobs while also challenging and overcoming racial and gender norms of the day. These women, these Rosies, acquired a swagger and confidence that would serve them throughout their lives. I might have an opportunity afterwards to talk about some of these women specifically. These women in inspired and influenced the American labor movement just by their very presence. Uh, but there is this also darker connection to what we have today. Just like in 2021, generally black women make uh, less than white men and less than white women for comparable jobs. That still existed during World War II. So it's not a new thing. Um, and I'd also like to say these women spearheaded and backboned the modern civil rights movement. I mean, they were, it's the same generation, same group of women. So these are some bad women. And you got to understand that how bad they were. And hopefully you'll see a lot of that in the documentary. So who were Rosies, right? Rosies were women who took the place of overwhelmingly, almost exclusively white men in industry and government in hundreds of different job categories during World War II. OK, my mother was a clerk typist in the U.S. Patent Office, uh, a traditional female job. However, the only reason she had the opportunity to get the job was because of World War II. Prior to the war, as a black woman, she could not have worked in the federal government. And that's what we need to like really understand about this time. So Rosie's were welders, typists, riveters, laborers, machinists. They made ammunition and gunpowder. They built airplanes, tanks, and battleships. There were even college-educated Negro women in Washington who were code breakers, code breakers. So a couple of Rosies you might be familiar with, famous Rosies, Maya Angelou was a Rosie, and so was the late actress Ruby D. So um, that's a little bit of background about what you're about to, to see. And again, thank you for attending. I'll see you after the screening. And I hope you all enjoy Invisible Warriors, African-American women in World War II. Thank you. have always been loyal when the ideals of American democracy have been attacked. We have given our blood in its defense from Christmas adults on Boston commons to the battlefields of France. We have fought for the democratic principles of equality under the law. 
equality of opportunity, equality at the ballot box, for the guarantees of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Working at the Navy Yard made me feel patriotic, that I did something to help the cause. We were doing something to help the boys. And it just made you feel special. My family was patriotic. I remember one time my, my a soldier came to the house and he said he was hungry. Mama cooked and fed him. He was a white soldier. You know, fellas, we here on Jubilee use a language that might sound off the cuff to some of you. When we dedicate a number to, say, a sad sack jack from Fond du Lac, a latched on jack and a khaki sack, woo! The same thing that black women did, again, perfected in World War I, they used in World War II to show their patriotism, all right? To volunteer, to give blood, to work with the Red Cross, to create, to, to buy these bonds. It was a community coming together. When I worked at Eastern Aircraft, we worked the swing shift. If you worked the second or third shift, you slept most of the daylight hours. If you worked the first shift on weekends, there was the USO. It was a black USO here in South Philadelphia. I think it was around Broad Street. And we used to go there when the boys would come in from the camps, give them treats and talk, dance. I was home by 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and I had to get up at 6 and go to work. I uh, met my husband at church. Bob was always a dancer and I had to learn from him. And we used to go to USO on the weekends to dance. Lots of servicemen were there. They wanted uh, young ladies to come because some of the servicemen were alone. We had the Victory Garden, we bought war stamps. We had uh, rationing books and we were careful how we spent our books. Yeah, we did all the patriotic things. But nobody in my family actually wanted to go overseas to serve on the front line. The country has asked the people to invest a billion dollars in one month to help pay for the war. And one of the most convenient ways and patriotic way was to take the war bonds. And I felt very strong about that. I saved those war bonds. And believe it or not, it was those war bonds that helped me and my husband to, to buy our first home. So it was patriotism and saving also. Washington, capital of the United States, now the focal point of the free world of tomorrow. Here, American history lives in monuments to heroes who preserved our freedom. Here again, the battle for liberty is centered. Washington was deeply segregated. A black person could not go downtown and use any of the restaurants, the restaurants or e even the toilets and other facilities. And it was so segregated that you had the feeling that you were in a foreign country. If we bought clothes downtown, if the, in the stores that would, they would wait on us, we couldn't try on anything. They had a people's drug store across the road from where we worked. And uh, at lunchtime, we had to stand at the end of the counter and the waitresses would wait on us in between, waiting on the others. And we would finally get our order, which we had to take out. We could not sit and eat. And uh, therefore, I never ate at people's any other time. That was enough for me. The whole issue of segregation was so real, even then, that uh, many times there were different treatments for black women and other women of color. It may seem puzzling that black women would be patriotic in the context of a racially segregated society in which so much blatant 
discrimination was occurring. The Double Victory Campaign was the answer to this dilemma. Double Victory stood for victory against racism at home, victory against fascism abroad. The two were intertwined. It was a consciousness raising movement that really laid the foundation in, in black people's minds that we have to fight for our rights. This is something that we have to do for ourselves. I feel like America belonged to me too. Honestly, let you know about what a journey this was, what a difficulty this was for her as a woman, as a black woman, and having to step up in this way to get this job, support the war effort, and still endure all that these women have described was a part of that process. Well, unfortunately, my mother transitioned before I started working on this project. And we never had, after um, she told me the story three or four times when I was a little kid before I even started school, we never had another conversation about it. And so it wasn't until I started working on this project that I was able to place my mother in the war in this context. And one of the things that I want our audience to know is that because of our work and, and the deliberate decision I made to expand the understanding of what a Rosa the Riveter was. Because prior to this documentary and prior to me speaking about it, Rosies were considered those women who worked in factories, shipyards, built, you know, the industrial workers. But as a result of, of our work, I have deliberately expanded the definition to include any woman, any woman who worked in the war effort. And clearly my mother is a clerk typist. Even today, we all know nothing happens anywhere until someone types out an order, a request, some type of real or electronic paper saying, this is what we want to do. Yes. So, so, so my mother, I sometimes, she worked in the patent office and I sometimes wonder what kind of things might've come across her desk as the clerk typist, right? But that's all I really know about her, her World War II experience. I have a million questions I'd like to ask her. But as a result of knowing these other women, right? Yes. I've been able to kind of put my mother in the big picture and kind of and, and know some of the things she went through, like riding in a Jim Crow car, right? Yes. She didn't tell me that as a little boy, right? Or uh, my mother moved to Washington. I don't know if she had some place to live. I don't know if her living conditions in Washington were what uh, the late Dorothy Height described, right? So, um, like I said, it's been a blessing to me to know these women because I got a better understanding of how my mother's life must have been in that time and her challenges and difficulties. One of the other things that I really appreciate about the film is that those people who are diligently working to catalog and present this history in the way that you have is, are essential to people my age and younger having any type of context for the history of oppression in this nation. Because the way we're taught history in school is that we were enslaved and you're lucky if you get you know, that kind of terminology, but we were enslaved and then we were freed. And then all of a sudden there was this opportunity, right? Because you were freed. And then, you know, yeah, some oppressive laws still continue, but look at how different that was. Look at how much better this was than you being enslaved. And, and part of what struck me profoundly uh, in some of the women that you interviewed is that they migrated from the South and some of them were still working in sharecropping jobs. Some of these things that the way history tries to present this period of time is that we had basically long since moved past that. Right. So talk to us a little bit about 
your feelings as you were collecting these stories and filming these conversations with this with these women about this idea that their migration and their elevation was still during this time of, of great tumult and what they were coming from, what they were coming to as they expressed to you. Well, first of all, in terms of what we know, we have to understand that American education is, is overwhelmingly the teaching of white supremacy and across the board, regardless of subject. So we have to understand that. Secondly, I'm glad you mentioned sharecropping um, because uh, sharecropping was a continuation of enslavement that lasted another hundred years. The system didn't finally fall apart and end till the early 1960s. So we got a hundred years. The other uh, thing um, you mentioned also, the way they teach our history, there was enslavement, maybe a little bit about um, reconstruction. Then there's Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. Right. Right? <laughs> so there's this hundred year gap where we didn't do anything. We weren't protesting, demonstrating, et cetera. But specifically to the sharecroppers, as I mentioned, when you look back to 1940s, as far as I know, we had three materials. We had cotton, wool, and silk, okay? Mm -hmm. So there were hundreds of thousands of black women and children who planted, nurtured, and harvested, harvested cotton. Think cotton, think uniforms, think yes. bed linens, think hospital supplies. Yes. So all of these women were contributing, and cotton was king. And yes. all of these black people were contributing to the war effort. There was this one clip where there was a little child on, on someone's cotton sack and her mother was pulling her through the fields. I just talked to a woman who was that li was the little girl on the cotton sack. She wow. grew up in Mississippi and that's what her mother did. Okay, so yeah. we need to, um, th and the final point I, I wanna address is our just knowledge of our history. A lot of people who were living during the war did not know about these women and the women themselves did not know about themselves. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges was that all of the women I met and interviewed all but one, had I had to give them a history lesson and talk them into the documentary because all of them except one, none of them knew that they had done anything historically significant. Mm -hmm. They had this good paying job for a minute, it was over and then they went back to, in many cases, their previous lives until they were able to do better, right? So uh, it's very important to understand that this was, this, the, the, this time, the women themselves did not see themselves as having done anything historically significant. And I'm getting stories now from, from women, overwhelmingly daughters, who said, well, my mother talked about working in a quartermaster, or she talked mm -hmm. about working at Frankfurt Arsenal, but they never had a big picture to put it in. And neither, right. did, neither did the women, right? Because in essence, you had 600,000 individual women Unlike if you were one of the 8,000 black women who went into the military during the war, you were part of a cohesive organized unit and you yes. knew your historical significance. These were 600,000 single individual women. And yeah. so that was like, wow. And, and so now they're getting on board with it and they understand now their children, grandchildren, Mrs. Ruth Wilson, who turned 99 two, year, two weeks ago, Mm -hmm. lives in South Philly, helped build an aircraft carrier. She told me her great grands treat her like a rock star. Because <laughs> Excellent. Big, big stuff. These women did not talk about it, but they didn't have a big historical picture or understanding to put themselves in. And so now they, had, they can talk to their, their grandchildren, great grands, and even great, great grands yes. like Ms. Wilson has to about what they did, their historical significance. The other thing, of course, um, that struck me about these stories is that I was born and raised in DC. Okay. And, you know, when, not only was I born and raised in DC, but I come from the fourth generation 
that was from DC. So my great grandparents all migrated from elsewhere and ended up in DC. And so our experience in the city has benefited from that sense of longevity and access and all these things. Yet and still, this history uh, and how significant it was as a path, as a journey, as an integral part of the Black experience in life in America um, isn't touted as part of that journey. And so in your film, when you talk about the significance of Howard University and Slow Hall, which is on Howard University's campus being uh, a dormitory for these Rosies and that kind of thing, why do you think it is that even in the context of Black liberation theory and, and the idea of a so-called progressive city like DC, we don't have this significant part of the history in, in our belts? The short answer is um, we've been here for almost 402 years. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in what is now the United States. We've yes. been here for almost 402 years and everything, if you think about it, where we are, how we are, it all makes sense because everything that has been done has been to teach us that we are nothing, we come from nothing, uh, we will be nothing. That is what we have been taught for 400, almost 402 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So yes. when you and, and, and so when you look at it like that over the long view, it makes perfectly good sense that you that people would not know this. You, it's hard to enslave someone psychologically if they have some sense of where they come from. Sure. Right. But, you know, when I was in school in Philadelphia, it was called Negro History Week. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and all I was ever taught was Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver every <laughs> year. Those are the only two Negroes I knew about growing up. Now it's Martin Luther King and people still don't really know who he, he was. Absolutely. So one of the sad things about, about what your comment is, Mrs. Gwen Faison, you know, former mayor of Camden, New Jersey. Yes. When she, she became mayor at 73, when she became mayor she used to go around to the schools in Camden, overwhelmingly black and brown. She would go around to the schools and tell people, I walked five miles to school and back. I drank out of a colored water fountain. I picked cotton. I rode in the back of a bus. They did not, these young people did not believe her. That is a problem. Yes. That is a problem. Because how can you make sense of today? if you don't know what happened yesterday and how you got here yes <laughs> right yes and yeah. how to carry that sense of pride because right. you're here right that that people before you endured all of this to right. bring you here to this moment right. and so that gets me to the process of creating this film because you uncovered your mother's story. And before we uh, gathered and, and opened the gates, if you will, to everyone who is uh, who viewed the film today, you said to me that you don't consider yourself a filmmaker, you want that you are an educator and you are a historian. And I, and I respect that. So when did it tip the balance for you to say that not only do I need to make sure that this history is known, but that I'm going to use the vehicle of film in order to gather these stories and share it and, and, and have a project that can endure. When I was a teenager, I, one of my goals was to be, I won't say a historian, but someone who created or had an impact in such a way that would have a positive impact on African-American people. I came to that desire um, 16, 15, something like that, teenager. The, the thing that led me to the documentary, and I, I, didn't, I didn't tell this, I, I was spiritually compelled 33 years ago to go to Bastogne, Belgium. I was spiritually compelled to go there. Um, 
I'll, I'll cut the story short, but I go, I go to Bastogne, Belgium, which was the focal point of the World War II Battle of the Bulge. Thousands and thousands of black men were in that battle. You don't hear about them. So I go into the museum and for the first time in my life, I see African-Americans in a museum about mm -hmm. World War II. That set off all this curiosity in me. I read and researched everything I could about black people in World War II, especially in Europe. I went backwards to Great Britain. I went back and that led me back to the US and the Rosie the Riveters didn't, you know, not a lot about the black ones. There are a number of books about black, about Rosies. Yes. White Rosies and there's a paragraph or two about black Rosies, but you see Dr. Maureen Honey, she has a book I would highly recommend you get. It's called uh, Bitter Fruit. It's a book about black Rosies, articles, newspaper, editorials, etc. I guess I've never defined myself by what I do because I've I've had I've had 27, at least 27 jobs <laughs> in graduate okay. school. I was you know, I've delivered pizzas, parked cars. I was even a night watchman for one night. <laughs> I, I've just never gotten into defining who I am by what I'm doing. And that's why, you know, I say I'm not really a filmmaker. I am a historian and I use film. If you're going to mm -hmm. connect with young people today, the new literacy, in my opinion, is audiovisual. Yes, sir. Right. And so there will be an educational version of this. It's a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. Because people tell me they have a shorter attention span, blah, 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 blah. And it needs to fit, <laughs> it needs to fit into a um, one period, you know, uh, sure. one period in school. I'm having curricula developed uh, three different, at this time, as we speak, there are three different on curricula being developed to support this in various areas. So mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question. Um, you no, you did. You did okay. that. I, I, I now I now better understand why you don't readily accept the term filmmaker yeah. as a part of the process. But one of the things that is evident if you stay for the very end of the credits, the way I always do, is that this did not happen in a vacuum. Right. That funding sources and all the researchers, all the people who contribute to not just the aesthetic of the film, but the substance of the film in various ways become incredibly important. And one of the funding sources that is shown is uh, the country of Netherlands uh, or the, the area of, how do you refer to the Netherlands? Because it's more than one country. Uh, but. I call them the Dutch. Yes, okay. Um, so, was this, how did you pursue that or did they pursue you after you mentioned going to Belgium and, okay. and that process? I believe in the force, a term I borrow from Star Wars. <laughs> yes. But I believe that the third law of physics is for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. And yes. so what you put out is what you get back. You reap what you sow, what goes around comes around. Malcolm yes, sir. Malcolm even said the chicken's coming home to roost. <laughs> All of those things are saying the same thing. So after 11 years of having very, very few resources between mid-September and early November of 2020, all of that support came to me. None of it was solicited, right? And the reason why the Dutch government got in touch with me, I wrote them a letter that didn't have as much bite in it as I, as I had recalled, but I wrote them a letter <laughs> and said, you have something to the effect, some white rosies a few years ago went to the Netherlands, met the king and queen. Oh. And they had another uh, activity, a fair event in Washington, all white women, right? Uh, yes. Back in 2008, Joe Biden and, and Barack Obama welcomed some white rosies into the White House, mm -hmm. right? So in my letter to the Dutch government, I said, I respectfully request when, whenever you do something else about Rosies, remember there are 600,000 African-American Rosies who also helped you, right? And so yes. there's, there's this special relationship that the Dutch government acknowledges between African-Americans and their government. So yes. there, are, there are 175. African American men buried in the American cemetery in the Netherlands, part of the liberating force in 1945. 
Yeah. And so they have recognized them. The irony of all this is, is that the Dutch government is recognizing African-American contributions in World War II to their liberation, but the United States government as such has not. Yes. And it's a little bit more com politically complicated than that here, right? Yes. Uh, so that's how that came about. The other funding sources, uh, the um, uh, Better Angels, Levine, Ken Burns, Library of Congress was yes. a thing that came out of nowhere for me. Didn't expect it. Another source. All of these. So in, 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 in six weeks from four sources, I got enough money to finish this after 11 years of getting very, 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 very little. Yes. But it was supposed to happen when it was supposed to happen. And here's the thing. If I had had all the money at the beginning, I would have finished this, let's say in about 2011. 2011 was not the right historical moment for this. Right. Now is the moment. Black, yes. black women rising, George Floyd global indignation at systemic ra racism, not only in America, but globally. Now is the time. Yes. The universe works and the divine works as it is supposed to work. It's hard sometimes being patient mm -hmm. <laughs> and the things we have to go through, but I'm good. <laughs> well, one of the things that I hope what you just said will spark in people who are in the audience is that, you know, we have all been so traumatized by this pandemic that um, to hear that whatever elements came together in the force to move those resources to you in this moment is something great and positive that we can gain from so much loss and so much history that has not been able to be elevated in the way this film does. So I'm very thankful that the right time is now and your film is going to reach so many more people. <laughs> One very practical question that uh, our audience member T asked was, did the women have health insurance? As far as I know, no one had health insurance. Um, and part of, uh, remember, Social Security came about as part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Right. However, the overwhelming number of Black people and Black women were not part of Social Security because they were domestics yeah. and they were uh, agricultural workers. And part of the deal so that FDR could get the legislation passed, he had to kowtow to Southern Democrats. Mm -hmm. And they would not have supported his New Deal had Black people, you know, sharecroppers, domestics, overwhelmingly Black people been included. So Absolutely. no, they had no, sh they had no um, uh, health coverage. But what I would also say as a group, they're much healthier than Americans are today. We saw some of the people that you named in memoriam. You, we, you told right. us about your crew member, um, your editor, who passed away just earlier this year. Um, may he rest in peace. What were, you know, we talk about the greatest generation. We talk about, you know, where most of the men who fought in the effort, how old they were and how old they would be now. Right. So uh, these women, you mentioned one who is still alive, who is 99. Right. Of the 11 so, women that comprise these interviews, is she the only one that's still with us? No, we've actually all but three. One And one of the three is Dr. Dorothy Height. Yes. Uh, Alice Amaro transitioned in uh, January 18. She worked at Frankfurt Arsenal. And mm -hmm. uh, the other one was Bertie Bush. Her funeral was actually on her 100th birthday. Wow. All of the other women are still alive. Uh, Susan King, the Riveter in Baltimore, mm -hmm. we, she travels with me sometimes. She's in excellent health. I just talked to her the other day. Uh, she, she'll be 97 in July, but <laughs> she's in excellent health. Uh, Mrs. Wilson here in Philly turned 99 two weeks ago. She's mm -hmm. on oxygen, right? And, yeah. and, and it's kind of interesting. She traces it back to the war. 
but other than that, she's fine. She does her cook, her own cooking every day. She she makes some serious fried chicken because she made me some, <laughs> right? Yes. Um, but she told me that during the war, you had to get coupons to buy food and cigarettes and gasoline. She said during the war, no one smoked. So everyone gave her their cigarette coupons. She started <laughs> smoking Tarrytons. I don't know if you remember Tarrytons. <laughs> Just I've seen ads, archival okay. ads. Right, right. So, so she smoked Tarrytons, I think, for forty-five years. Wow. So now she's on oxygen, but other than that, she's cool. That's beautiful she's image. She's the model in the introductory image. That image called Victory. She's the model. She was eighty-eight when she posed for that. She told me next year when she turns a hundred, she's going to do a pole dance. So I told her I'd be there with the uh, with the camera crew for that. <laughs> You gotta warn me when you say something like that. I love it. Please be there with the camera crew to oh, capture yeah. just the spirit of that. David asked, did you get any input from men to include in your research, even though you decided focusing on the women in the war effort as Rosie's, but did you speak to any men just as a part of the background research? I didn't, I, my first documentary was overwhelmingly men, chocolate soldiers from the USA. Uh, this was about women, and and so uh, no, I did not. I would also say, oddly enough, out of the seven women Rosies, I'm not sure how many children they had between among them, but there was only one son. Everyone else were girls, and wow. it's been the daughters, in some cases, granddaughters, but mostly the daughters who are now pushing eighty, right? Mm -hmm. Who've been the ones helping me. Okay, so no, I didn't, you know, uh, I didn't talk to any men about it. And what's interesting, um, the people turning out to see this both live and virtually, overwhelmingly women, overwhelmingly women. And I'm not- Why do you think that I, is? I have my theories that I can't say here. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but I think it's unfortunate that, that you know, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense for me. But, you know, what has happened for me is over these 11, I've been hanging out with women, I'll say 85 and up to over 100 for the last 15 years or so. And um, they have uh, changed me. I've had to look deeper at who Black women were, who they are their strengths, their love, their courage. And, and I've had to look at my mother differently. You know, she was mom, sure, <laughs> right? But I've had to look at her differently and, you know, her strength. And Black women, I, I've concluded, you know, Black women are bad. Okay? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, often get a bum rap. But when you talk about taking care of business, Black women take care of business. And so in this journey, most of the people who have helped me, most, not all, but most of the people who have helped me are Black women. Mm -hmm. And I am so, I am humbled by this. I is part of my, my goal. I decided five, six years ago, I want to help, I want to be an ally, help uplift and support the efforts of Black women. For people who have been moved and impressed by what they've seen today, who are not in this immediate area, how do they stay in contact with you as all of the product, if you will, continues to be finalized so that they can contact you about using it, licensing it, whatever your uh, intended process will be? I can be reached at invisiblewarriorsfilm.com, invisiblewarriorsfilm.com or invisiblewarriorsfilm at gmail. Dot com. And if people reach out to me there, uh, you know, that's the web page and my email. If you reach out to me there, I will definitely respond. By the way, we're working on a major event in December live. It's the 80th anniversary of the uh, bombing of Pearl Harbor, which opened the door for these women. Again, we're talking about the Dutch government, National Council of Negro Women, uh, the Basil and Becky Educational Foundation, and some really big names, but I can't say right now. Sure. And we're talking about having a live event with those, with all those people there, and the Rosies and their daughters there to honor them. The Dutch government and I, 
I insisted that they give some type of official recognition to the Rosies in the documentary. I told them this is part of their family's legacy and history that they yes. can pass down. And um, so if COVID is tamped down, it's gonna happen. But you know, that's still kind of up in the air right now. Yeah, well, we will all be watching uh, with bated breath for that. So now that the Netherlands have provided some support that you were gonna stay on them to continue recognizing these families and everything, is there a way to backdoor into the United States beginning to do the same, to not only provide you some level of funding, but to maybe elevate what you're trying to do educationally so that, um, there will be more opportunity for students nationwide, if possible, to experience this film or maybe pursuing something with PBS. Like, you know, do you have some thoughts about how the United States can step up? I think it's going to play out. Also, remember the last November, the US Congress approved the Congressional Gold Medal for that, for the Rosie the Riveters, right? That's huge. Right. The woman, her name is Mae Cryer, worked on it for 35 years. She's a rosy, worked out in Seattle. So last year, the Republicans finally signed off on the bill. What I'm told is the, the medal won't be available till late 2022 at the earliest. But what I'm told is because of, and I believe it's because of our work, there will be an image of a black woman as part of the artwork the image on the congressional gold medal so, well i tell you what if we US get if we get that medal in conjunction with harriet tubman on our 20s then we will know that some progress is being made in a real way to recognize these contributions of african-american women to all different kinds of of facets of our society i want to give you the opportunity to share any final thoughts Sure. Uh, any last words with our audience about what you want them to take away from today's screening and just experiencing this history? Respect Black women, respect all people, but res especially learn about the history of Black women and how they have supported and uh, backboned in many ways our existence and our history in, in, in this country. And the other thing I would say, particularly to young people, who have smartphones, right? Yes. Find, find the elders in your family and go up to them, you know, ask them, tell me about something doing about your life. Tell me about your reaction the day Martin Luther King was killed. You know, pick something out and learn about the elders of your family because yes. they're, they're, they're all live historians. And they all have these experiences. And they, we, we, one of the big mistakes we've made, I think, as a people is we've tried to protect our children from certain harsh realities of our existence here. I understand that, but I think it's done more harm than good. Okay, Jewish people let their children know about the European Holocaust as well they should. Yes. Right. We have tried to hide our children from that big mistake. Yeah, I fully agree. It's one of the biggest, it was one of the biggest arguments I've ever had with my father that, you know, thankfully I was the type of child who was always empowered to ask questions. Okay. So I asked enough questions where I eventually sort of backdoored my way into my family's experience. Okay. And I'm now doing that research through documents and photos and all kinds of other things. But that advice that you gave us about the smartphones and capturing that oral history while our elders are still among us is some right. very, very valuable information. And I hope that people in our audience today will take that away. Well, Professor Cook, I thank you very much for your work. You. you know, you and I had this conversation back when I was with WURD. This was when the film was still a work in progress. So I am delighted to see where it is now, to hear where it is going, and very glad that I had an opportunity to do this sort of follow-up conversation with you about this film today. Thank you. And thank now you. we'll turn the program back over to James to close us out. Thank you, Professor Cook, uh, for uh, this labor of love, love of history, 
uh, love of the uh, African American and Black community and, and love for Black women. Uh, Stephanie disappeared off camera, but thank you for so masterfully, uh, as you always do, uh, guiding the conversation, pulling our audience uh, members in and, and just connecting all the dots. Uh, I, I really uh, appreciate both of you for being here. Uh, I saw a t-shirt once, I hope to find it. <clears throat> it was a play on the scripture <clears throat> that said, says, I can do all things through Black women who strengthened me. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I think we all stand here as living witness. And, and certainly this film is a testament to the resilience and the power uh, that Black women have been, uh, not just for our community, but literally the world. Thank you for uh, spending the Sunday afternoon with us. I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and please stay connected to us. Uh, and on that note, everyone have a good night.